Welcome to the first lecture for International Regulatory Frameworks for Climate Change and Environmental Management for 2019. I want to begin by recognising and paying my respects to uh, the traditional owners of uh, this land, elders past, present and emerging, and future generations on which we hold this land in trust. I won't dwell on this, but this is the first of 12 lectures where we are going to tell the story of the major international environmental treaties since 1945. In this lecture, I just want to give you an introduction to the course and then talk briefly about who I am, who you are, and then run through the course pro profile and look at course aims, uh, what we'll be doing, the field trip assessment, and those sorts of things. So let's start by stepping right out. This picture was taken on the moon in 1968 in the Apollo 8 mission. It's a really famous picture. It's called Earthrise. I'm sure you've seen it. It was taken as the astronauts were standing on the surface of the moon. The Earth, it was an unplanned shot. The Earth came up over the horizon and they thought it would look good to take a few pictures. So there's a series of these. This is one of them. And so you see our beautiful planet sitting there in the blackness of space from the moon. This is another picture, again taken on an Apollo mission, this one Apollo 17 in 1972. It's called the Blue Marble, again a really famous picture. It, when I was a, um, a child, this picture was really common on atlases all around the world. It was the first picture that was ever taken from space where there was no shadow on the Earth, so if you see um, the Earth in that image, there's no shadow, so the sun was directly behind the spacecraft. And you can see it looking down with Antarctica at the bottom and then Africa uh, reaching up and those swirls of massive clouds. Uh, and just a really beautiful picture that really captures uh, so many processes and different scales of time and space and so many as we know, so many wonderful people underneath um, those clouds. So it's common to see the world um, without borders. It can be viewed from many perspectives. So I'm sure we've all played with Google Earth like this. I was just playing with Google Earth. And you know, it's great fun to spin it around and look at, you know, drill down on Papua New Guinea, go out, look at South America, you know, spin it around, look all over the world. So we're really used to doing that now, and it's really fun. So a world without borders, it can be viewed from many perspectives. But we also have borders uh, on maps. Um, so uh, here, just a common image showing you know, the mass of countries that uh, are artificial constructs from our society, essentially imposed on the world that physically doesn't have borders, at least biophysically. But we know that in um, politically and governance terms, there are some very real hard borders if we come down to the surface, um, we have this incredible place in which we live. So I took this picture a few years ago uh, on Strabrook Island, on North Strabrook Island. I was um, on the beach and my uh, young kids were playing in the water and the sun was going down and the water was coming in. It was just a beautiful day, beautiful Strabrook Island day. And we're surrounded by this incredible natural beauty. So this was a picture taken by a student in this course uh, back a few years ago when we were on the field trip in Springbrook. And I just love it because it just uh, captures, you know, the beauty in the, in, in the um, microcosms around us on every leaf. And we have some truly awesome species like this green-eyed tree frog. It's only found in the wet tropics and you have to say that is a very cool frog. And some incredibly beautiful places. This is Ha Long Bay in Vietnam. Anyone been to Ha Long Bay? Couple? Yeah. And a world with lots of amazing, wonderful people. And lots and lots more people coming. So this was a screen grab from, I took yesterday from the world meter real-time world statistics. You can go onto that website and basically you see the clock spinning for you know um, births this year, births today, um, deaths this year, deaths today, and the net population growth. So as of yesterday at 8 a.m., the, the world population was estimated to be 7.745 billion people. 
And we have a world filled with truly courageous people, such as Greta, um, Greta Thunberg. And we've got an amazing human history, including in Australia, uh, the recent uh, discoveries of uh, indigenous culture going back unbroken in Australia, uh, 65,000 years. So truly incredible timescales. And an amazing, amazing culture around the world. So the Great Wall of China near, near Beijing and a world with great art and enormous happiness. So here's some uh, performers in the carnival in Rio. And we have a lot of mega cities as well. So I'm not sure, where, anyone got an idea where this picture is taken? I'm not sure if it's New York. Can anyone pick one of the? Yeah, it's, New York. it's New York? Okay. Okay, so mega cities. And many places are densely populated. So uh, in Hong Kong, it's, there's the most densely populated place on earth. It has an average of 130,000 people packed into each square kilometre. So just think about that UQ <laughs> is about a kilometre across. So think about walking across you know, UQ from sort of river to river and you'd go about a kilometre, and in that sort of square space, uh, packed 130,000 people. So, you know, like UQ normally has a population during the day of around 20,000. Imagine, you know, 130,000, so 10 times the number of people packed into it. And some cities have grown at incredibly rapid paces in recent years. This is a picture of Shenzhen in China. The inset picture is, was taken in 1980, and it was essentially a small town with a lot of rice paddies uh, right on the coast, and then since then just massively expanded into this massive city now. And some societies are rich and have high standards of living, so no um, prizes for guessing. Um, we're showing Brisbane there, so we're a really rich society with high standards of living. And some communities are really poor. So I think this picture's in the Philippines. It didn't actually have a cap caption, but I'm, I think it's, any, you guys agree? It looks like Philippines? Somewhere in Southeast Asia. Picture from um, Bangladesh, um, great poverty. And many people work in virtual slavery, no doubt some in actual slavery, but you know many people um, in sweatshops around the world, basically working for subsistence wages or less. And humanity has changed the earth enormously. Some places are heavily polluted. So here's a picture that was um, Beijing. This is um, New Delhi. And many communities are vulnerable to even small changes in environmental conditions. So this is the Maldives, a picture uh, of a coastal a house in the US uh, uh, with the flooding after Hurricane Sandy in 2012. And picture taken just a few days ago here in Australia. So we're very vulnerable to even relatively small, seemingly small changes. So at present, we've had mean global warming of about one degree. And we have got catastrophic effects in many parts of the world, including in Australia. So the massive fires, fires that we've had in recent weeks and months in Australia are in substantial part contributed to by climate change. So increased temperatures cause drier conditions, hotter temperatures on the day uh, spark, you know, much worse fire conditions. So the fires we're experiencing now are partly caused or substantially caused by climate change. So that's at one degree. So the global plan is to allow the mean global temperature to go up to two degrees or 1.5 degrees with fingers crossed. So that's the global goal that we'll talk about under the Paris Agreement at the end of the course. So we've already got catastrophic conditions. We've got a collapsing Arctic. We've got massive coral bleaching. Uh, we've got wildfires in, in Australia and California and heat heat wave conditions in many parts of the world at current levels. And we're planning to go higher. So I mentioned coral bleaching, so uh, I'll focus on that when we talk about climate change. But there's been four massive coral bleaching events around the world since 1998. Uh, there was a massive event in 2015, 2016, huge bleaching of the Great Barrier Reef. Uh, 
Professor Justin Marshall from here at UQ, a, a coral reef expert, described it as Australia's biggest ever environmental disaster. Now that's at current levels of warming, at mean global temperature rise of around one degree. We've got massive impacts. And this year, uh, we're on track to be the second warmest year on record, at least based on the first 10 months from January to October. It's on track to be higher, not as high as 2016, which was the highest, but still way up there, so second highest. And we can expect, I should just say, we could expect uh, Great Barrier Reef to bleach again in January, February. So the summer months when the extremes, extreme temperatures hit it, we can expect that to occur in the coming January, February, March. It might not. A big cyclone can come in and stir up the water and cool things down. But if we get basically doldrum conditions, so the water's not really moving around for a few weeks, and low cloud cover, where you get the, basically the water baking, those are prime conditions for mass coral bleaching events. So the situation's primed for that. We don't know if it'll actually occur this year, but it's primed for it. And in that context, uh, the world has made some steps to addressing those sorts of issues. So in 2015, we had the Paris Agreement that we'll, again, we'll talk about at the end of the course. And yet, we make some progress, but we're also pretty good at killing each other. So we've spent a lot of money each year. The US spends about 700 billion. China spends a huge amount as well, about 200 billion. Uh, and then a range of other countries spend a whole heap of money, basically to kill each other. And we have a world with unspeakable suffering caused by deliberate human acts. So this is a poor child that was uh, hit in um, a bombing of Gaza in 2014. And we've also got widespread crime and heavy responses to it. So um, police uh, going into one of the favelas, the slums in Rio. And we're also in a grim period for climate policy and international relations with, I'm going to choose these words carefully, but president, narcissist, corrupt con man, and climate denier, Donald Trump. Now, we can learn important lessons and insights from current international and uh, national politics. So while uh, Trump's presidency is going to end at some point, there are some important enduring lessons from his election for the future. And I thought this comment was um, apt. Trump, Trump won the 2016 US election because he consolidated the growing number of angry voters who felt let down by the people and institutions controlling power in the country. And if we look around the world, that's quite common. So the 2016 Brexit vote was driven by exactly those same feelings of fear, anger and resentment. So the politics of fear, anger and resentment are embedded in our national and international politics. There's no shying away from that. Like you, we're not just going to wish a world of fairy tales and utopia that we all get along and we all um, love each other and help each other. Um, we have to work within the reality that we've got and we can't escape it and we have to recognise it and address it. So I thought about that a lot and I just wanted to summarise my thinking in, because I don't want to just say we've only driven by fear and anger and resentment, because that's not true. We know that there are a range of emotions that drive us and drive political decision making and public opinion. So I tried to put some what I see as opposite. So hope versus fear, dreams versus anger, compassion versus resentment, cooperation versus isolation. And none of those exist in isolation. Um, or, you know, is the only thing. So it's not just anger that drives our communities. Obviously, there's dreams and hopes and compassion and cooperation. There's a lot of things that we do in those realms as well. But there's this whole mixture of what drives us as people and therefore what drives public policy because governments respond to what the public is demanding, at least at some level. So in that background within that context, what's the role of international environmental regulation in all of this? 
So I'm going to summarise it as this. The current state of global affairs show there's no end point where success is guaranteed for a safe, prosperous society. We're going to see through these lectures that so the world has taken big steps since 1945 to the end of World War II to address some of the major challenges that face us globally in terms of environmental problems. We've taken some big steps forward and yet if you look at the current situation of global politics, you could be despondent and think, you know, we're going backwards. Um, and at one level it be, would be fair to think that and feel despondent. I want to give us a broader perspective and say, well, look, if we look at our past, our present and our future, all of these things are all intermixed and there's no end point where we should just feel despair because, you know, the current US president will go, if not, you know, in the coming election, uh, in the next election, there'll be someone else. Whether they'll be better or worse remains to be seen, but there's constant change and we shouldn't feel despondent. So we have to work with the reality uh, and not some abstract theory or utopia. And I really want to focus in this course not on abstract theory and utopia. It really annoys me, the, um, particularly you see in uh, textbooks about international environmental law and regulation where you just see all of these treaties presented these gr with great words and all of these things that are supposedly happening under them. But if you actually step into reality, those great words rarely translate into actual practice. So I want to take us, so we'll talk about the great words, but I really want to move us into thinking about, well, how is this implemented on the ground? And particularly through the research papers, thinking about not just criticising it, because it's really easy to throw rocks at this system and say, oh, it's not working, it's a failure. But I want you guys to think about not just that it's a failure, but there are some things that are working okay, and how can we improve it? So how can we make a practical difference through your careers in making the situation better? So, within this context, do we have any common goals? So this is really complicated world with a lot of different drivers, but can we start our course by thinking about our common goals? So could you take out a page? Uh, do you guys want a bit more light for this? So open page. Uh, if you've got it, some people might even have a bit of paper. Uh, but if you've got a page, um, can you draw a tree? Now, you don't have to be a, an expert at drawing a tree, but take the whole of an A4 page, draw a tree, you want some roots down the bottom, and then leave enough space for some words to come within the leaves of the tree. So a nice, big, simple tree. Stem, some roots. Cool? So I want to ask... What are our goals or what do we think of as a good society? And one of the great things about this course is we've got people from all around the world, from all different cultures. So we've got a real United Nations, a melting pot. And I want you to think about your society where you're from and think, is this a goal, you know, if you're from China, in China? Is this a goal if you're from Chile? You know, is this a goal in Chile? You know, is this a goal that my society actually is striving for. So let's look for some universal goals that we can all agree on. We might not agree how to get there, but let's at least agree on the things we're aiming at, wherever you're from. Okay, so the first one is this, and you can add this to your picture. Jobs, employment. Does everyone agree that that is a goal of our societies? We want jobs, we want people to be employed. Everyone happy with that? Okay, so we've got Universal agreement on that. Okay, next one, housing. Does everyone agree that we want housing for our people? Yep, complete agreement on that. Clean food and water. Everyone agrees on that? No cultural differences on that one? Peace and security. Everyone agree on that? And we can see around the world places where that just is not reality. So Syria, uh, epitome at the moment of breakdown in governance and society and lack of peace and security. 
But those are goals we want. Even in, like in a country like Syria, they still want peace and security. They don't have it, but it's still something that the people want. Next one, public health. So broadly, they're going beyond just clean food and water, but you know, do we want people to be healthy in the sense of um, you know, freedom from widespread disease, um, the like? Everyone agree that that is a universal goal? Yeah. Okay, well, we're doing well here. How about this, strong families and communities? So, and notice I've deliberately phrased this to avoid any religious element or sort of ideological element. Would everyone agree that whatever cultural background you're from, that strong families and communities are one of the goals that your community wants? Yep. Okay, now this next one, we've got universal agreement to this point. This one might throw you, and you might think, happiness. You don't normally see that, at least in Australia. And then we, is anyone here from, lucky enough to be from Bhutan? No? We've had some students from Bhutan in, in the past. So Bhutan is famous for essentially looking for happiness in its society uh, and striving, what is it, instead of a gross domestic product, they have the gross happiness index. So um, happiness. We don't, in... Australia, if, it, if a, it would be really rare for a politician to talk about, you know, we want a happy society. It sounds um, almost silly. But I wanted to put happiness there because I actually think it's a goal that we just don't normally talk about. And in happiness, I'm going to lump in things like you know, going to a beach and being able to walk with your family on the beach and enjoy like a clean environment, so enjoying nature, um, so going to a sporting event, if you like sports, so you know, if you uh, can go along to a sporting event and cheer for your favourite team, or you go, you like arts, you, you like to go along to a music festival and enjoy, you know, great music. So we'd agree that our societies, you know, want to be able to do those things, so we want, you know, people to be able to go to listen to great music. Everyone agree with that? So how do we lump that into a goal? Like we could call it, you know, good arts, but I, I sort of want to bring in things like, I think of like happiness, like maybe walking on a clean beach with my family and enjoying them building sandcastles. And you get to that through a whole range of those other goals like peace and security and the like. But happiness is actually something that I think we strive for at a community level. What do you guys think? Is that a reasonable summary of something that we strive for we often don't articulate? Can you think of a better word? Okay. If we're happy that that's a universal goal, then are there any other goals that you think we have in your society or globally? Yes? Yes? Equality, that's a great one. So, sorry, can I just pause on equality for a moment? Equality. So equality for men and women? Um, gender equality, income equality. I agree. I'm not sure that it's a universal goal, and I'm thinking particular, particularly of like the, um, the politics in the US, where it is very much directed at inequality um, and maintaining the status quo. So I'm not sure that equality is actually a universal goal, but you could certainly, I could, let's have a think about, about it. I'm really trying to look for things here that, you know, even the most conservative member of sort of like a politician in the US wouldn't object to us saying we want strong families and communities. Equality, I'm not certain. But you could put it down there with a question mark. Any others? Sorry, you had a, someone had another point? Sorry? Politics. Politics? What's the goal there? Transparency. Transparency in politics? Okay, that's a good one. Let's Maybe just write that down at the bottom of your page, transparency in politics, because I'll come back to it. 
Any others? Yes? A better future? Yeah, that's an interesting... Um, yeah, I've often ployed, toyed with the word prosperity as well because it's different to it's just putting wealth there. You notice that there's money isn't included in one of the goals. It might be something that might, you know, we might use to, to you know, buy a house or you know, go to sporting events and be happy. But I haven't put it there as a goal as such, and that's a deliberate choice. Um, yeah, do you want to just put that down on your page? Um, yes? Um, opportunity. Opportunity. Again, that's another good one. Again, I'm not certain that it's universal goal because I'm thinking like, say, in countries like Saudi Arabia, where there's great segregation and you know the wealthy really protect their position and keep people who are poor so is it a universal goal like if we thought of saudi arabia do we and the only country I really leave out of trying to think of these goals is north korea because they're nuts so peace and security you know they're still at war uh, and i think probably the people want peace and security but um, yeah. Yes? Um, I think if you can expand on how things make it more broad and have it as like industry innovation and infrastructure. Housing, so expanding on innovation. Yeah. Goals. It's not just housing, it's just infrastructure overall. I think everyone's going to better schools and Yep. Yeah. Housing, yep. Yeah. Better schools. Yeah. Yeah, infrastructure is good. It's not as I probably haven't put it up there because it's not a really. Uh, it's a word that I've tried to use really basic words, so like strong families and communities without any. So yes, housing. You know, to supply clean food and water, you need the infrastructure to do it. And take away, for instance, you know, you need the sewage systems, for instance, to achieve public health uh, and clean food and water. But I haven't put up there. Um, good sewage system because that's not actually our goal I think I don't think our goal is good infrastructure our goal is you know clean food and water public health and those sorts of things and we have the infrastructure to achieve those but the, the infrastructure itself isn't a goal does that sound okay yes um, education, is one. education is a great one can you write that down on your page and I'm going to come back to education Community engagement, again, that's a great one. Can you write that down? Um, I wanted to comment on equality and opportunity. Equality, yes. Yeah. So equality and opportunity is listed as one of the sustainable development goals, yes? Not just equality or opportunity, but equality in general. Equality, yep. So I That's a great point. Write down equality, but can I actually flip and add to this? Because I've, been, we've been, I've sort of put this up imagining it as a tree with these sort of like fruit that we're plucking. But can I actually just go on to get, go on to the roots? Because I actually want to distinguish between the goals that we aim for and how we get there. So one of the roots of all of those goals, like peace and security, one of the roots of them is good governance and justice. And in justice, we can include things like equality. Because if you don't have a just society and with good governance, then you really don't have peace and security. You'll have a large part of the community who are dissatisfied, unhappy, and pushing for change unless you know, they're repressed. And even if they're repressed, they might still be pushing for change, but it's, you know, it's dangerous to do that. So good governance and justice and things like equality, I'd like to think, to think of them as the roots of how we achieve, but, you know, we, most people don't actually think about good government as a goal that we want, um, you know, like an outcome. It's, we might say it as we want that, but it's really to facilitate everything else. Like we want good government to facilitate peace and security, to facilitate public health, to facilitate 
jobs and employment. Does that sound okay? So thinking about the roots here that give them. Yes, the concept of capability. Yeah, um, I think we could pack all of those into good governance and justice. At least I want to just suggest that to you as an idea. You might disagree with this. This is my idea for how we can think of good goals. But what I'm trying to do is unpack and not use the word sustainable development or anything that's wouldn't. I'm trying to use words that would make sense to anyone that you talk to on the street. Like if you walked up and said to anyone on the street, do you want a peaceful and secure society? I think anyone would say yes. Whereas if you walk up and say, do you agree with Sustainable Development Goal 6? Um, then, so I'm trying to unpack it and use really basic terms. So good governance and justice has got a lot in it. Education is another absolute root that supports this whole tree. And someone mentioned education before, but again, I don't actually think education is a goal, an end goal in itself. We have education to facilitate all these other things, like peace and security, and particularly in our world today with 7.7 .7 billion people and you know millions of people in most countries, uh, some countries with billions, we simply can't make do with everyone just doing their own thing. So we need good governance and justice. We need education to provide the infrastructure and the education systems, the everything that makes society actually work in our big, complicated world. So that's another route. And now the piece de la resistance, if anyone likes Lego movies. Um, right down the bottom, the tap root for all of this is maintaining nature or a healthy environment. Because, and I very much want to emphasize this, if you cut off that taproot, you kill the tree. So, and a friend of mine likes to quib in public talks, if you don't believe in a healthy environment, try holding, try holding your breath for 10 minutes and see how you go. Um, so a healthy environment, nature, that's the bottom. And I really wanted to emphasise this as an idea for you because one of the big problems we face in environmental protection globally, here in Australia, but you know, many cultures around the world, is this idea that um, it's jobs versus environment. That if you're going to protect the environment, you can't have jobs. And I actually think it's so fundamentally mistaken. It's just a mistaken dichotomy because there's no question we want jobs. It's that we want jobs that don't kill our society and kill our planet. So protecting nature um, is the taproot, or often, if you want to say it in one sentence, I say it as uh, a healthy environment is the foundation for a prosperous society, so including jobs. So that, that metaphor of a foundation is one that's commonly used in in you know, communicating ideas. So um, this idea of a tree is one that I have worked on for years, really to try and combat that idea that is so common in our culture that it's jobs versus environment. And I really want us to leave that behind us in this course, but it's a really important um, cultural blindness that you, know, you guys need to push back on in your careers if you're working for environmental protection. We're not anti-jobs, we're actually pro-jobs, but pro-protecting um, the environment, sustain society along the way. Okay, any thoughts on that? Criticisms? Not to be difficult. I would argue that equal rights is just as integral, because if you don't have that as a foundation, if, you know, say, like, in the States, black women are four times as likely to die in yep. childbirth, so that's going to affect public health. Or yep. Yep. Environmental injustice, then they don't have access to food through the water. E equal rights is critical. Yes? I, I agree with that. I, I mean, I would put it in good governance and justice, but you can expand upon that. This is my idea that I'm presenting. It's not, um, I've tried to basically, 
work through the universal goals, but you could word them in different ways. Like I haven't, um, you know, this wasn't, I didn't find this chipped in stone um, that can't be moved. It's an idea uh, to think about, and you can change the language if you wish. But I can accept um, equality is a critical component of good governance and justice, and you could include it there. Yes? That's a, yeah, that's a, great, that's a great point. Why did I use public health? Um, I used it really just again to be a, a, a broad word that was easy to understand that isn't jargon based. I didn't mean it in a jargon sense. I was really trying to unpack all of this into no jargon. So I didn't have any technical sort of intention. Any other points? Okay. So that um, idea is one that I'd like to build upon and make a sort of central component of our course, that we're not anti-jobs, we're about protecting a whole range of um, goals within and, and achieving a whole range of goals. Jobs and employment is one of them. But there's a whole range of other things that we are striving for within our systems. And protecting the environment is the foundation or the taproot of achieving all of those goals, particularly over the medium and long term. You know, you can pollute your environment catastrophically, possibly in the short term, but that's not a lot. There's no not long term, and so it's not sustainable. So a good society is sustainable over the long term. Okay, a couple of questions that I've, I've posed um, based on comments from previous classes. Um, one is I haven't put up obeying God as another social goal, and no one suggested it. Um, but in, and that probably reflects Australian culture because we're a very secular culture where we try and separate out religion and the church system from governance. So it would be very rare for a political leader in Australia to, to really set religious goals or frame their goals in a religious uh, context. They would try and use more universal language. But in some societies, I'm thinking Saudi Arabia, a range of other societies where um, religion is a core part of the society, then obeying God might be one of their social goals. Uh, and if that's the case, you know, they could add that, you know, one of the things in the tree. Um, I'm not going to add it, though, as a universal goal because it's not a universal goal. Everyone happy with that? Without in any way saying it's wrong to have that as a goal? I'm just saying it's not a universal goal, so I'm not putting it there. Uh, and the second is freedom. This was uh, suggested by a student a few years ago. And it's an attractive one, isn't it? Freedom. Um, one of the things I tried to avoid was also talking like democracy isn't there. Uh, and that was deliberately because large parts of the world don't have democracy, and particularly thinking about China, and yet they function. Uh, and I don't, I don't think democracy is a universal goal, so it's not there. And freedom also, like if you're in a society that uh, doesn't have democracy, then that is a vote for the government, then the level of freedom will be to an extent constrained. But the real reason why I haven't included it is not because of say, different systems of government around the world that are less free um, than a democratic system, it's because, in my view, freedom has become a heavily polluted word in the US system, where freedom is used as a catch cry for anti-government. And I'm very much in this course saying we should recognise the benefits of good government. And so good government is a core way that we achieve all of these things. And freedom is often used at the present time essentially in a libertarian sense where it's anti-government. You know, the government can't do that. I have a right to be free. Uh, it's particularly used, you know, in their arguments about gun control or the lack of gun control and their right to bear arms. So freedom has become a catch, an anti-government cry. So I haven't included it, but you could include it if you thought it was a really important goal. 
Anything else that anyone wants to add or comments on those couple of additions? Okay, food for thought. Okay, good governance. Now, I really want to emphasize that so this course is very much about giving you practical skills for your careers, particularly in research, but also want you to leave with a, um, an appreciation of the value of the international regime for all of its problems and failings, the things that it achieves um, benefit us every day. Every day of your life, you receive benefits and everyone you love receives benefits from the international environmental legal regime, protecting you from a range of pollutants, um, uh, a range of problems. So good governance is epitomised by predictable, open and enlightened policy making, a bureaucracy that's imbued with professional ethos, acting in furtherance of the public good, the rule of law, transparent processes and a strong civil society participating in public affairs. The flip side of that, poor governance, is characterised by arbitrary policy making, unaccountable bureaucracies, unenforced and unjust legal systems, the abusive executive power and widespread corruption. And corruption is a huge problem globally, uh, including in Australia, um, but um, globally um, Australia isn't, uh, rel is relatively free from corruption. So this is a, um, a map of the world that I saw a few years ago. It was from a report by Baker and McKenzie, an international law firm, where they'd surveyed their client, their multinational clients. And basically, the redder the country, the more corrupt it was perceived to be by the international um, clients that Baker and McKenzie had. So particularly Russia, um, Africa, many parts of Central and South America are seen as particularly corrupt, and Southeast Asia. So corruption is a huge problem. I had a, a student from Colombia uh, several years ago in this course and she was interested in doing her research paper on biodiversity conservation and she came to me and, and said, well, this is all good in theory, but I know in my country the huge problem is corruption, that there's no way that anything we suggest will, that I suggest will actually be successful because the corruption is so systemic that you can't implement these things because of the corruption. So corruption is a huge um, issue and a huge, um, hugely difficult problem globally. So this course is about empowering you to understand the major international environmental frameworks so that you can contribute to good governance wherever your career leads you, whether you're in the private sector the, or the public sector. So. I want to break every hour from our lectures, but can I just go on before we get to the course profile and talk about who I am and who you guys are, just really briefly, and then we'll take a 10 minute break, grab some coffee, and we'll come back and talk about the course profile, cool? Okay, so who am I? So uh, Chris McGuire is my name, and I put this picture up because a lot of people are only gonna see or listen to the recordings for this course. So this is me, and uh, I was did my undergraduates here at UQ back when dinosaurs roamed the campus, we, you guys got all these fancy computers. We had stone tablets. So you would come in and you would chip away. The lecturer would talk and you'd chip, 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 chip. So I did a science and a law degree back in the 90s. Uh, and then I worked for the Queensland Department of Environment for a couple of years after graduating. Came back to Brisbane, did a Master of Laws and a PhD. Started working as a barrister and uh, then uh, in 2010, I came here to UQ and worked full-time as a full-time lecturer, teaching this course and also a, um, another course aimed at domestic environmental law uh, in semester one. Uh, I don't teach that anymore. I just teach uh, this one and I've taught it the last few years just on a casual basis. Uh, and in 2017, I went back to working full-time as a barrister and currently practice in a range of environmental law-related areas, uh, including up in Papua New Guinea. Uh, but yeah, international law is, for me, bread and butter sort of background to a lot of the work I do, implementing domestic laws that are essentially about trying to achieve international goals. So that's my background. Um, so my professional experience is primarily enforcing domestic environmental laws uh, and 
international law is normally only a background issue. I've got a website, Environmental Law Australia, um, with some case studies of litigation I've been involved in, including the Japanese whaling case, uh, which I'll talk about uh, in our next lecture when we look at the International Whaling Convention. So my current work focuses primarily on climate litigation, particularly against coal mines uh, and coal-fired power generators uh, in Australia and illegal logging in Papua New Guinea, which for me is very much linked to climate as well. Okay, and I'm going to say it, um, put it on the table right now. Um, I often feel crushed and inadequate for failing to stop large coal mines and the tremendous damage we're doing right now to our world and future generations. And I'm going to talk about that towards the end of the course and uh, I think it's normal to feel that and you guys if you're going to work in this sector in your careers uh, it's important to be sustainable at a personal level and deal with you know all of the losses that you will sustain during your career because you're going to they're going to lose a lot of things in during the next say four decades of your careers uh, we are going to have a lot of things that are going to go bad and um, you guys are going to need to deal with that. So I want to talk about that towards the end of the course and personal sustainability. Ultimately I believe in working with the inadequate tools I've got and do what I, doing what I can to make the world better and save as much as I can. So um, for all of my inadequacies uh, I think get in and do the best you can with what you've got. And one lesson that I have learned is that to, to sustain yourself you need to take time to recharge and I do that by going and walking in places that I love. One of the reasons why I take you down to Springbrook uh, for the field trip is, apart from that it's a World Heritage Area, uh, is that it's a place that I often go around Brisbane to recharge. I think it's a really special place for me and I want to take you guys there to experience it. I think it's really important that you look, you have strategies to sustain yourself because it's, burnout is a really big problem in the con conservation and environment sector and you need to take time to look after yourself. So I've got a couple of um, beautiful daughters. So this is Isabel and this is Isabel and Eva. And that's her big sister giving her a hug. Do that a couple of times because it's so cute. <laughs> Yeah, she doesn't always hug her now. The little one there is now five. No, she's actually seven, isn't she? So, yeah. <laughs> that wasn't happening this morning, I can tell you. This is me with my dad back in the 1980s. Uh, my brother took this picture. I should have a caption there saying Mark McGrath. This is standing on Whitehaven Beach in the Whitsunday, so I'm from North Queensland. Anyone been to Whitehaven Beach? Best beach in the entire world. I'm not biased. Um, so I grew up uh, in the Great Barrier Reef and the question that's driven my career for the last two decades is this, will we leave the Great Barrier Reef for our children? And that's really what I've focused on in terms of career direction is trying to answer that question. And it's with tremendous sadness that the conclusion that I've reached for the last 10 years is that the answer to this question is no. We are not going to leave it. We are not going to leave coral reefs. We are deliberately choosing to let them go because we, we care about them, but we are just too... I can't think of the right word. What we can't do to actually protect them. Selfish. Um, we want to party now, knowing that we, or you know, kids in the future are going to pick up the tab. But it's really clear that we're not going to have coral reefs. So who are you? This is a picture taken of the class uh, back in 2011, standing under the water, one of the waterfalls in Springbrook. So, and this is us in a tree. So, um, great thing in this course is it's incredibly international. This was a little graph I did. Um, back in 2014 and it's a similar sort of mixture this year just we've got a few less students but about 50% of the postgraduate course is from Australia and then there's this 50% spread from all around the world so many from China anyway so hands up if you're, from, if you're from China so we've got half a dozen so hands up if you're from Australia start with the Australians so we've got maybe 50% 
China, we've got another um, big chunk. Um, other countries that folk come from, yes? Estonia, Estonia. wow, great. Wonderful to have you. Nigeria. Nigeria? Cambodia? Cambodia. Malaysia. Malaysia, wonderful. Anyone else? Japan? Japan? Yeah. Great. Okay, so, uh, and in the international course, sorry, in the external um, class as well, there'll be students from all around the world. So the course was originally designed for postgraduates. Uh, this year, for the first time, we've actually got more undergraduates than postgraduates. So there's about, um, there's about 80 students at the moment enrolled in the course. I expect it will drop back to about 50 by the end of um, the semester, mainly because people realise around the time that the assignment is due that, you know, they're really enjoying their summer holidays and um, they'd rather keep um, on holidays. But this course was set up a few years ago within the school uh, to give students an option for summer semester. So deliberately we have all of the lectures at the start and recorded so that students can go away you know, to a home country. Most students don't have any other courses during summer semester. But the course is deliberately set up in this way so that you can leave and everything can be done um, remotely. Uh, the exam, if you're an external, ex enrolled externally, then you can even sit the exam um, in a country of your choice by working that out with the examination section. So the course is deliberately designed as a summer semester course. Um, yeah. Okay, and yeah, this looks like the world's got chicken pox, but actually this was in that year, the, the countries of origin from, from students. And so students come from all around the world um, and enrolled in this course. And I think that that's a great strength of this course. And I really love the fact, so I try to use relatively few Australian examples and so you'll see we'll have case studies from all around the world as we go through the course. Okay and uh, lots of great past students so this is I'll tell you some stories about past students as we go through the course but just one here um, Maria was a student in 2013 and when she went back to Mexico she worked for the Mexican government in biodiversity conservation this little selfie she's taken she sent me the picture and asked if, if I could talk about her in courses so she was uh, using what she'd learnt in this course very much on the ground and hopefully some of you guys will too. Okay, so in summary, who are you? Can I summarise you in this way? Okay, you're smart. I already know that. You wouldn't be here without having passed hundreds of tests, hundreds of exams. So I'm taking it as a baseline that you're really smart. And in fact, I'm sure that most of you or all of you are smarter than me. I'm just like a few years, well actually a lot of years on in my career. Um, you're inspiring. I love this course and I love um, the classes because you guys are inspiring and so uh, I've set up a little discussion board forum. If you could post something about your background, uh, I'd love to uh, you know, hear where you're from and you know, what are your goals from the course and maybe your career ideas because uh, it's really inspiring and it's lovely to hear what other people are doing that you know, you're not just alone wanting to change the world and make it better. And I also know that you're not here for the money uh, because no one studies um, conservation, biology or governance um, for money. Uh, if you were um, after money, then you'd be studying accounting or law or business or some other soulless degree. Uh, you want to make um, a contribution to the world, a positive contribution. That's what you want to do. So in that context, what's the role of international environmental policy in your career and what role do you see yourself having? So as I said, I put a, created a thread on the discussion board. I'd love to, you know, you guys to just post a little bit about your background, where you're from, what your uh, ideas are, what you'd like to see from the course. And for you, well, why is international irrelevant to you now in a period of seeming momentum for isolation and retreat from international agreements and institutions? So Brexit is you know, reversing the push for a more integrated Europe, one of the major positive forces for international law globally and improving human rights, improving environmental protection has been the European Union and the breakaway of the UK from it uh, is very much um, a retreat from that globalisation, that, that regionalisation in Europe. 
So why is international regulation still relevant to you in this context? Well, the answer I'd give to that is this, that this is relevant to your career because there's a whole heap of problems that cannot be solved in isolation at a national level. And those problems are going to outlast the current political fights and continue for the whole of your careers. So there's lots of problems that individual countries can't solve alone, and those problems aren't going away. So the fundamental reason, you know, for all of the problems with international environmental regulation or international relations generally, you know, why, you know, people can throw rocks at the United Nations and talk about all of its problems, and sure, it's got a lot of problems, but why do we have a United Nations? Why do we have international treaties? Why don't countries just do their own thing? Well, the fundamental reason why countries agree to give up some of their sovereignty to cooperate and do things in unison is because there are problems that they can't solve themselves. So if there's a global problem, like say global terrorism, or global drug trafficking, or international crime, or global climate change, or international trade, they can't solve it alone. And that's the fundamental reason that is always going to push for cooperation. There's, okay, there's, there's always going to be this tug for nationalism and isolation, but there's also this push for cooperation. Okay, let's take a pause um, for, say, 10 minutes and go and have a coffee. I'm going to pause this now. So welcome back from our break. Let's turn to look at the course profile. And can I just paint a big picture for you for how I think of this course? I think of teaching and learning in a complex course like this, a bit like a game of chess. So there are multiple pieces moving, both from me and from you, because for you guys to learn and develop skills, you need to engage in the course. So what I'm trying to do is lay, the, lay a platform for you to help you learn. And I've got a number of uh, teaching strategies that I'm using, a number of major components. One of the components is the lectures. And that's trying to give you a potted version of, you know, an overview of the major bits of international environmental law, tell it in an interesting way, bring it home to you. So that's a big part of the course. Uh, we've also got some workshops on developing your research skills. But another really big part of the teaching and learning strategies in this course is actually the assessment. Because you might think, well, that's strange. Isn't assessment just about giving you a mark? Well, yes and no. Good assessment is actually about helping you learn. So good assessment that's well designed should help you learn and develop skills. Because, you know, you could look at, you know, go and trawl the internet and get all of the information that we're going to cover in this course and, you know, why do you need to do the course? Why not just go and get an encyclopedia or buy a textbook? What, what's the value you get from undertaking a course like this? It's not just the information that's given to you, but it's engaging skills to do things in the course. And we normally tie that to marks and assessment and give you a mark. But for me, the big objective and how I design assessment is really about helping you learn. So assessment is a big component of the whole learning process that we're going to go through in the next few months. Uh, and then also other things that are part of the course are the field trip and a couple of workshops and seminars. So a theme of this course is that international law and policy is not something that only world leaders do in far away capitals and your career may well take you into the international arena. Even if you don't work in the international arena per se, if you're working at a national level, you often will be implementing international programs. They mightn't actually have the words international in them, but if you're like working in, say, for the Queensland government, dealing with conservation, working for the Department of Environment, you know, in Queensland Parks and Wildlife Service, um, you know, national park system, you might be working in World Heritage areas or not. Even if you're not, if you're just working in any biodiversity sector, you'll be effectively implementing international agreements um, on a day-to-day -day level. 
So understanding the background to those things is really helpful for you and useful in, in understanding the wider perspective. Okay, so the course profile is available on the Blackboard site and you can just go online and have a look at it if you want to. Um, so the course aims to develop your knowledge of international environmental regulatory frameworks, your research skills and your ability to think critically about international and national environmental problems. So critical thinking is a big thing that I really want to work on. There's some learning objectives there, I won't dwell on them. Um, learning resources, uh, the main thing is you don't need to buy anything. We're really going to use, you can get everything you need from the great websites for the big treaties. So like the Biodiversity Convention has a great website, the United Nations Convention of Law of the Sea, great website, um, uh, the Framework Convention on Climate Change, great website. So there's a huge amount of information that's just there at your fingertips and you don't need to buy anything. Uh, I've given a couple of um, online references. There's one, uh, Kiss and Shelton from 2007, Guide to International Environmental Law, which, sure, it's a decade old, but in terms of looking at things like sovereignty or some of, some of the underlying concepts, they haven't really changed. That's freely available online. I've also asked for a... Oh, no, it wasn't Kiss and Shelton. Kiss and Shelton is, yeah, available online. Um, the Robinson text from 2006, the training manual as well. Uh, if, you, if you want to look at basic concepts, then those are still good references. Uh, I've also asked for Principles of International Environmental Law by Philippe Sands and Jacqueline Peel, which was published last year, uh, to be for the library to purchase it in an electronic version, so it's available for everyone as well. Again, you don't need to actually go and purchase it or even look at it online if you you know, don't feel you need to. You can get enough just by essentially looking, listening to lectures, um, looking at some of the websites, looking at the treaties. I really want to take you to the text of treaties, not just you know, a textbook that talks about the text of treaties. So bottom line is you don't need to buy any textbooks. Everything's available on the internet. Um, and yeah, there's some good um, online texts if you want to look at them. So yeah, lots of great websites for the major treaties. This is just a screen grab I took yesterday of the Convention on Biological Diversity um, website. The UN also has some free online courses about international environmental law. Uh, I like them uh, because they're interactive and they have quizzes to test your knowledge. So you could go, if you're interested in a particular treaty, you could go and look at the courses and yeah, the whole range of um, resources available there and quizzes. And as you know, we've got the course Blackboard site where materials related to the lectures, the handouts, all of those things are available. And you might have seen an email from me saying I started a Twitter account. Um, I thought, because I've always put up items. So one of the points I've made um, in the past is, you know, international environmental law is always in the news. Like if you look at any news on ABC, you'll see things that are related to international issues. And I, in the past, I've just posted them on a discussion board forum uh, on the Blackboard site. But it's, you know, Blackboard's fairly clunky and it doesn't, you know, display pictures and the like. So I thought of looking for a new platform and I thought about either Facebook um, or Twitter. Uh, and I thought I'd go with Twitter. Uh, anyone suggest a better platform than that? I thought Twitter would probably be regarded as too old by many people. Um, so I didn't go with Facebook. Um, Plus, they've got all their problems with, yeah, Twitter, you know, some crazy people use it. But uh, anyway, you could, if you want to go and look at that, I'm just posting their stories that are relevant to international environmental regulation um, that I just see in the news, and I'm just posting them there. I really want to bring home to you the fact that when you're looking at the news, on a daily level, there are uh, international environmental regulation topics that are in the news. So it's, again, it's not just something that's happening, you know, in New York about world leaders. International environmental regulation affects us on a daily basis. Um, in section four of the ECP, there's the list of lectures. Again, the ECP is really clunky. Um, so that's why I've given it to you on a more colorful uh, handout. So this is essentially the same as the uh, ECP, just in a more colourful layout. So 
And then I've also presented it, so that's the whole semester, um, with the, the, including the research presentation and research essay and end of semester exam. So that's sort of our schedule for the whole semester. And then on the flip side, I've put the program for this intensive week of teaching. So we're on Monday uh, in the introductory first lecture, and then we're going to move on to the Charter of the United Nations in the next lecture in the International Whaling Convention. And then after lunch, the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, and uh, the Antarctic Treaty, and then a research design workshop in the afternoon. And then tomorrow, Ramsar Convention. So essentially, just going back to this one, we're working through all of the major international treaties since 1945 in chronological order um, set in, to set them in their historic and political context. So we're looking essentially at international environmental law and policy as this evolving story that has a past, a present and a future. And you guys are very interested in the present and the future, but how we got to this point you need to understand the past to how we got here. Okay, so that's the overview of the lecture lectures this week. Any questions on that? Or have, there's more environmental treaties than we'll cover, um, but these are the major ones. Everyone happy? Cool. Okay, why start at 1945? Well. A really practical reason is that since really the 1960s, there's just been this explosion in international agreements. So this is a graph of international environmental agreements since 1900. And you see that really prior to the 1930s, there was nothing, no international agreements. Each country basically did their own thing. And then since the 1950s, it started to grow. Uh, and then the 1980s, this huge number. So we see this, and we'll see that when we look at the big uh, treaties, that essentially there's very little for the first two decades, and then there's this explosion of treaties in the early 1970s, the World Heritage Convention, the Ramsar Convention, CITES, and then some major treaties after that, and particularly in the beginning of the 1990s, the Biodiversity Convention, the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, these all of the big parts of the system were really in place by 1992. And there's still ongoing evolution, but all of, I call it the modern period really for the 1990 to the present, really everything was in place. So we're just seeing the evolution of it. And I wanna do that because a lot of treaties make a lot more sense when you see them in their historic context and the things that they contain made sense at the time. They might seem strange now, like when we look at the Antarctic Treaty, which was signed in 1959, the first article of the um, convention says, Antarctica shall be used for peaceful purposes only, and the establishment of any nuclear facilities or nuclear testing shall be absolutely prohibited. Looking at Antarctica in 2019, the thought of doing nuclear testing in Antarctica seems like a crazy idea, like absolutely nuts. But if it went back to 1959, it was the height of the Cold War. And the Antarctic Treaty was this massive achievement at the time because it was an instance where the USA and the USSR agreed to basically leave Antarctica off limits. Uh, it was seen at that time as there was a threat of potential World War III starting, um, that nuclear testing could be carried out there. It was so remote and inhospitable but these major superpowers of the time came together and agreed to leave it as off limits. They wouldn't do any testing there. And so reading the treaty in today's eyes, it seems strange, but back in 1959, it was actually a massive achievement to agree to leave it off limits for nuclear testing. So those are reasons for setting these treaties in their historic and political context. Also, I want to tell the story of them because I, I'm a real believer that storytelling is in really critical to how we learn and remember. So I want you to think of this as an evolving story where we're all characters and there's a past, a present, and you guys are going to be involved as characters in the future. Okay, so those are the lectures. We've got a field trip on Wednesday. Nice break in the lecture week. 
completely voluntary whether you, whether you come or not, uh, but it is a great uh, trip. Springbrook's a wonderful place. We go down, uh, it's about two hours uh, south of Brisbane, down behind the Gold Coast, Springbrook National Park. So we get in a bus, we drive down, we get out at a lookout that basically looks out um, like this. Some years we've gone and it's been pouring with rain and um, you wouldn't have seen this view, but I, I think everyone would be really glad if it was pouring with rain on Wednesday, but I think it's highly unlikely. So it looks like we'll have a dry, uh, hopefully no fires. Um, so this is the class uh, under one of the waterfalls that we walk under. There's all this series of waterfalls that we go under where the trail goes behind them. Um, we'll run a photo competition as well. So if you've got a great camera or even if you've just got you know, a phone, um, bring it and take some pictures and then there'll be chocolate prizes later in the week for the best photos, okay? So this was actually the, the, the people in the photo competition. Um, this is part of the trail that we go on. Um, this is them all taking this picture of, actually, no, that's not. Uh, that was one of the winners from 2014, uh, standing under the waterfall uh, in a dry section where the, the veil of the waterfall is behind a beautiful waterfall called Rainbow Falls that we walk to. And then this is a picture uh, taken by a student from Kenya in 2014 looking out through a gap. So there's all these beautiful cliffs. And this, where those uh, students were all lined up on the bridge taking pictures out, this is the, what they were taking pictures of. It's essentially where one of the waterfalls goes over the cliff edge. And this picture is actually taken from that bridge. So yeah, I made the point that it's important to stay in touch with wonderful places like Springbrook and they recharge you. And that's, the field trip's really about just the experience of going there. Um, we talk about World Heritage, I wanna take you to a World Heritage site. It's a really beautiful place. Okay, so bookings were due last week. If you really wanna come, um, let me know. I haven't um, heard how many spaces there are on the bus, but if there's space, you're really welcome to come. Okay, shall we turn and look at briefly at assessment? So i uh, given this to you in summary on a handout. So there's three bits of assessment, a research proposal, a research essay, and an exam. So the research proposal is worth 5%. It's due um, any time from this coming Friday to the next Friday, but I'm flexible with times. I really just want you guys to uh, tell me what you're doing for your research paper early on so that I can give you feedback and tell you that you're going in the right direction and that your topic's appropriate and that basically it's about early feedback. And because you're gonna give me something and I can hive off a bit of the marks, I've allocated 5% to it, but most people will do, you know, you get four or five. It's not meant to be hard. It's meant to be easy where you tell me what you're going to do and explain it clearly and I give you feedback. So don't be stressed about it. Um, you can either present it on Friday, but I suspect most people will just upload it to the Blackboard site and ask me for basically written feedback online. So you don't actually have to present it to a class. Uh, the purpose is to give you feedback on your topic. And for most people, the feedback will be, yep, that's all good, you've identified a clear topic, you've got a clear international convention, a clear case study, uh, it, looks a pr it, you know, it looks like you'll be able to do what you're planning to do within the next six weeks you, that you've got for you know, a realistic sort of amount of work for the time and space you've got. You know? it's, you're not trying to take on a PhD that's gonna take you three years to complete. You've actually got something that's small enough and discreet enough that you can do it in the time available. Most people, that will be the answer. Uh, or that's the feedback that I'll give you. Um, there'll be some people, just based on past courses, that have tried to take on too much or don't have a clear idea what they're doing, probably about 10%. And it's really, the feedback is really valuable for them. But for most people, it'll be, you know, you'll know what you're doing, you've got a clear idea, and that's fine. So that's the research proposal. Um, what you have to do um, is basically give me two documents. You, so you don't have to present. There's two documents. There's a research design template that's available on the Blackboard site in the research proposal tab. And it's just a couple of pages with a few headings. So what's your proposed title? What's the purpose and objective? What's the context and significance of the research? I'll talk more about that this afternoon when we do our research design workshop. 
So I don't want to dwell on that now. We'll talk about it this afternoon. But essentially, you give me that document, which is basically what you're proposing to do in words. And then you also give me some slides. So they might be in a PDF format, or you might actually present them and talk to them. But you don't have to. You can just give me some slides, upload them to the Blackboard site. And typically, they will have you know, like a title page, what you're planning, you know, the title of what you're doing and then a map of the country that you're looking at and a couple of pictures relevant to what you're doing. You don't have to put all the text there of what you're doing because I've got the research proposal, just some pictures, you know, a map and some pictures. Think of that, explaining what you're doing. There's some recordings on the link, um, which again is available on the Blackboard site, some recordings of students actually presenting their research proposals back a few years ago. You can watch that. And I hope you find it you know, interesting and valuable, what they were thinking of and the feedback that they got. But again, you don't actually have to do a presentation. You can, if you want to, just uh, give me the documents and I'll give you feedback. If you want to give a presentation or ask me any questions, that's fine. Um, I've given my mobile number on the um, Blackboard site and the information, so you're really welcome to call me. Um, during the course if you've got any questions uh, but or send me an email but you don't have to present. Is that really clear? And it's really about feedback. So I know it's due early on. If you need a little bit more time I'm happy for it to for you to have a few more days beyond the due date but what I don't want to do is for it to drag on for weeks because I don't want you to have that horrible nagging feeling all through the summer holidays that I've got to get onto this research paper and I'm not really sure what I'm going to do and then the night before the research paper is due suddenly decide on your topic and you have the all-nighter horrible experience um, that is just makes it yucky. I really want the research paper to be fun for you where you work at it gradually and it's a good planned well executed um, research experience and not stressful last minute. So by forcing you to commit at the start, you can change your topic. So if you decide after giving your research proposal you actually want to do something else, that's okay. But it would be best if you actually come up with the topic that you want at this stage and then you get feedback on it and then you work towards it you know, steadily. Cool? Any questions on the research proposal? Okay, we'll talk more about it this afternoon in the research design workshop. Okay, in terms of, I just mentioned this for any external students listening, you don't need to listen to all the lectures before presenting your research proposal. Um, if you're external, just listen to this lecture and then the research design workshop and then essentially they can just listen to the lectures at their own pace uh, during the semester. So you don't have to listen to the whole week of uh, lectures back to back because it's really only this lecture and the research design workshop that are really essential for you to do the research paper. Okay, then going on to the research essay. So your task is to evaluate the effectiveness of the implementation of an international regulatory framework in any country of the world and make two or more policy recommendations for how the implementation can be improved. Again, I'll talk more about this this afternoon in the research design workshop, but there's a couple of components of that. You're evaluating the implementation of any international regulatory framework. So it can be biodiversity convention, it can be the framework convention on climate change, it could be a convention that we haven't, you know, we're not actually covering in the course. So if you wanted to consider something else like um, the Basel Convention on International Trade and Waste, you could consider that. Um, it's really open-ended and also you can choose any country. So my suggestion would be choose your own country. So if you're from Australia, you can look at Australia. You can choose another country if you want to, um, but the benefit of doing your own country is, A, it's really relevant to you. So if you're from China or from you know overseas, by doing your own country, it's, you can immediately see the relevance when you go home. Um, two, you already know the culture and there's all of these background issues that are relevant to actually evaluating the implementation that are cultural and uh, also you won't face any language barriers. So for instance, if there was an Australian student who wanted to look at um, implementation of something in China, I would be cautioning against that 
if you didn't speak Mandarin and you hadn't spent years in China to understand the culture because there's so many barriers to you doing good research where there's a language barrier or a cultural barrier. So, um, but you can, you're not, you don't have to do your own country, but feel free to do your own country. In fact, I would encourage it. Um, and then, so you evaluate the effectiveness of its implementation, so how well it's doing, and then you have to say two or more reasons or two or more recommendations for how it can be improved. And that's a really important part of it. So not just there's problems, I really want you to think about how can we improve it. And there's criteria and standards for that research paper. I won't go through them in detail, but have a read of them, have a think about them, because that's what you're marked against. And I would really emphasize the third one, the utility of the recommendations that are made. So sometimes people just evaluate and don't make any recommendations. Well, there's 25% of the marks is actually about the recommendations. It's a really important part. I want you to think about how it can be improved. And then you get top marks for the recommendations if they're highly practical and useful for improving policy that are clear, succinct, synthesized, and justified by the evidence presented and show real insight into the issues um, studied. So you, I'm looking for insight, practicality, based on evidence. That's a really important part of the, the research paper. And the most common reason why people lose marks in the research paper is um, there's a you know, good analysis and then recommendations just sort of appear out of the blue air. That recommend, you know, that it's been looking at all of these issues and then suddenly there's a recommendation that hasn't been addressed in any of the evidence. There's no real reason, no real relationship between the evidence presented and the recommendations that are made. So it's really important that you think about that. Cool? And again, we'll look at making good policy recommendations in a workshop tomorrow. And I'm really hoping that um, this part of the research is a really valuable part of the course for you. Uh, again, we'll come back to that more in, in workshops and you can ask me questions as we go along. Are there any questions about the research paper at this stage? It's worth 50% due on the uh, 10th of January. So after, yeah, about, I think is that about six weeks? Something like that. Cool. Okay, there's some examples of past research papers available on the Blackboard site that you can go and have a look at. You can present your paper in two main formats, either like a research, like a paper that's to be submitted to a journal, or, and this is what most people do, present it in a report style format where you've got a cover page, a table of contents, a list of recommendations, and then you know an introduction, a body, maps, and the like and a list of references at the end. That's the most common way people present their research. But if you wanted to aim at like a publication, I'm really happy to support that. But um, the report format is really common. So you'll have a table of contents and really also hoping that you'll, this will help you um, work on your professional writing skills because a big part of professional careers is being able to write good reports and make logical recommendations, whether you're working for government or in the private sector. So being able to do that is a valuable skill wherever you're working. So I really want to give you good feedback. Uh, and I've got a, um, a marker, Dr. Carol Booth, uh, a colleague of mine who I actually used as the editor for my own PhD when I did it over a decade ago. Uh, she's a really good editor and she does the first cut of the feedback and gives online feedback as well as you know feedback in detail. And then I'll review her marks and, and finalise the marks from there. But she really put a large effort into trying to give you good feedback um, so that you know, you're not just submitting something and I give you back a mark that says, you know, well done, good job, pat on the back. But actually some good constructive feedback in a positive way, but constructive feedback on your writing and thinking and how well your report writing went. Cool. And I'm hoping that that feedback will be another really useful part of this course. Okay, um, at the end, we've got an end of semester exam. Uh, again, this is about helping you learn from my perspective. Um, 
it's also, you know, you, as you know, universities have a huge problem with um, essay mills. So it's really difficult to just have a course now that's just entirely assessed by essays because of the problems in, you know, of essentially people paying other people to write their researches and submit it. So by having an exam where you front up with a, um, you know, student ID card, sure, there's I'm sure there's people that game that system, but at least it's a way of you know checking that you know people um, who sat it. Uh, so there's a hurdle for that, I think, of 40 or 50 percent. So you've got to be able to, you've got to pass that to pass the course. Even if you did really well on the essay and, you know, badly fail the exam, then you won't pass the course. Uh, and um, what I try and do in, for the exam is to help you a lot. So on the um, Blackboard site, there's student information already. Um, so for the undergraduates, I should have said too, for the essay, um, there's the same criteria and standards, but the word limits are different. So for undergraduates, you've got two to 3,000 words. For postgraduates, you've got three to 4,000 words. Don't be stressed about the word limit. It's just basically there to give you a broad um, thing to aim at. The main thing is you're not writing a PhD of 100,000 words. It's somewhere in you know a few thousand words. If you want to go further, that's OK. Um, I have to set an upper word limit because the university requires it, but I can tell you now, I'm not going to take any marks off for anyone going over the word limit. No, not going to do it. So um, don't be silly about it, you know, but um, I want you to write what you want, um, not be constrained by sort of artificial limits, but those are the broad parameters for it. Uh, in terms of the exam then, so up on the Blackboard site, there's this, um, so the exams are different between the two courses. Um, the undergraduates have um, three parts, a short, short answer, medium length answer, and an essay. And the postgraduates have short answer, medium length answer, a mandatory essay, and then a part D, choose one of three essays. So what I'll do towards the end of the semester is um, choose um, uh, three um, recent research articles uh, that are relevant to international environmental regulation, um, put them up on the Blackboard site, and you get to choose, so the postgraduates get to choose one of them to critically evaluate. And then in the exam, um, you essentially have to do you write down your critical evaluation of that article, but you'll, you'll be able to, you'll know what the articles are, and you'll be able to choose it, and you go into the exam and do that. So the criteria and standards are there, don't want to dwell on that, but this is the part C essay question. So, um, so this is 12 marks out of 45. This is the actual question on your exam. It's been the same on all of the exams since 2010. So worth 12 marks, you already know this out of 45, so you know, over 10% of the course is um, you get for answering this question discuss the development of the major international environmental treaties since 1945 in the context of major historical and political events. Your analysis should explain the major administrative and regulatory frameworks created by the treaties and their historical context in terms of the major political and social events occurring when each treaty was created, what further developments can be expected in the future and why. So that question is asking you for what? a summary of what we're covering in lectures. So you've only got about 32 minutes to answer that, which will go really quickly, because we're going to cover a lot of material in the lectures. Uh, so in terms of taking notes for the lectures, what I'd suggest you aim to do at the end of each lecture, or you know, um, after you know, the end of the lecture week, is to summarise each treaty in just one paragraph, because you really will only have um, time to write about a paragraph on each treaty. So, you know, it might be for the World Heritage Convention. You know, the World Heritage Convention was a major treaty agreed in 1971. It established a framework for the protection, the recognition and protection of um, properties of outstanding universal value to humanity. Um, there was a list created under it which, um, upon which properties can be nominated and it's the heart of the convention. There's also a list of World Heritage in Danger, you know, paragraph in the World Heritage Convention. 
but there's not a lot of detail there. Um, you won't have time for that, but essentially just take the story that we deal with in lectures and put it into an essay. Um, the other thing too with the exam is uh, you can take in two pages of notes, so it's not open book, because I want to give you as many questions beforehand so you're not surprised by them on the exam. So I'm giving you this essay, so I'm giving you this question, so I can't just make it open book so that you know someone could take in an essay that someone else has written, but you can take in two pages of notes. So years ago I had a statistics course here at UQ, and they let us take in two pages of notes with the formulas on it that we learned during the semester, and I actually found it really good. And so I had years of doing this course where it was just a closed book exam, and I wanted to try and de-stress it, particularly for international students, because I know it's hard writing in a second language, or harder. So to, one of the strategies to try and de-stress the exam is to allow you to take in two pages of notes. So it, you can have anything on it. You can have diagrams, it can be handwritten, it can be typed. Some people print out 20 pages to one. So, you know, like, <laughs> it looks like an ant has sort of run across the page. Um, so anything that you can fit on a double-sided A4 page uh, of any font size, whatever you want, it can be there. So one of those pages, I'd suggest, might be um, your answer to this question. And it might just be dot points of the list of, so virtually, you know, the handout I've given you on the course schedule. Just that list of treaties, you know, because as soon as you see the word World Heritage, Conven World Heritage Convention 1971, and you can just then do it in chronological order. You know, you can write about it pretty well off the top of your head and say something about it. So key thing is I want to de-stress the exam, tell you what it's going to be beforehand. Everyone happy with that? Okay, so uh, we'll talk more about the uh, research essay in the workshops, but I want to wrap up our first lecture now We've looked at broad introduction to the course and the context, the complicated world that we live in, who I am, who you are, run through the course profile briefly. Uh, you're really welcome to ask me any questions as we go. Can I just end by summarising the take home points as these, and I'll do this for each lecture. Uh, firstly, protecting the environment and international environmental regulation is not anti-jobs, anti-human, anti-wealth, etc. Protecting the environment, good governance, justice and education are the foundation for achieving a good society and all of society's goals, including jobs, public health, happiness and everything else that we want to achieve. So it's a foundation. And this course is very much about that, a foundation. It's not anti those things. The second is that this course is about empowering you with practical knowledge of the major international environmental frameworks and skills, a skill set around research, so that you can contribute to good governance wherever your career leads you. And thirdly, the major practical skills that this course aims to give you are improved research and policy analysis skills, and that's very much the research paper and the feedback you get from that, and thinking about you know, the policy recommendations particularly, is really challenging to come up with something that isn't already being done, will actually make a difference, and that a government would actually implement is actually really hard, because if it was easy and cheap, it would already be done. Um, and if you simply say, oh, I'll throw a lot of money at it, well, as soon as you involve money, it becomes hard, because government doesn't want to spend it. So what can you do that balances a whole range of competing interests that isn't already being done, actually achieves something that a government will actually implement? That's a really hard. So. Um, I hope that those will be really practical skills that we can hone for you during this course. Um, in terms of further reading, um, you can go and have a look at the, some of those textbooks on the Blackboard site, but as I say, you don't need to, um, but they're there. Uh, and download the research design temp template from the Blackboard site and have a start thinking about the research topic. Again, we'll look more at that this afternoon in the workshop. Okay, that's the first lecture. Um, why don't we take a break uh, for, say, 10 minutes. Uh, coffee, tea, if you want. Go and stretch your legs. Come back and we will dive into uh, the story of the major international treaty since 1945. We're going to kick off by looking at the UN Charter.